next to mine. I didn't want to be right next to her. All right. Click Invest community. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, this is part four of a four part series that we did with Ron Plonis. Thank you, Ron, for being on again. Rosario. Okay, so uh, part one, if you guys missed it, was on deal sourcing, and we dove uh, specifically into off-market opportunities and some of the myths and and uh, truths, truths behind off-market opportunities. And then we dove into, uh, in part two, month zero method, which essentially is, is doing all the dirty work before you close on the property. So uh, getting your contractor bids, going to the village, um, checking for permits or applying for permits even before you close on the property. Uh, part three was managing the construction process and overseeing your contractors and just making sure that project is, is, is as, as efficient as possible. And today, part four, we're going to be talking about sales listing slash leasing, depending on what you're doing. Um, a little bit on a little bit about Ron. So if you guys uh, haven't seen any of the other parts of this series, so Ron uh, is a real estate developer and investor. He's been doing this for several years, has done over 500 plus projects in our market. And a lot of what he does today, in addition to investing, is helping investors and partners, institutional buyers and hedge funds, just really dial in their processes so they could be as efficient and effective as possible. Because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of this series is from getting you from the deal to deposit, meaning depositing a check, which means you actually did the project successfully and you're not showing up to closing with money, which can be pretty painful. So Ron, thank you again uh, for, for investing your time with us over here. Oh, you're welcome, appreciate it. Did I put you to sleep already? No, there was a little choppiness on the network challenges that we're uh, been having lately. Yeah, we, we've had, this is the, the second location we've moved to. Today's just been a funny day with internet connection. So uh, there's Ron's information there. We already have several clients at Click Invest that are, that are working with Ron. Uh, if you guys want to reach out to him directly, there's his uh, cell phone number, or you can schedule a call at that link there, or uh, visit him at ronplonis.com. So thank you again, sir. Oh, no, I'm happy to help. Okay, so overview again, what we talked about, uh, part one, deal sourcing, part two, go time, part three, execution, and then today, sales lease, uh, sales listing and leasing, how to deploy the right systems and partners when it's time to monetize your deal. That means make money. So Ron, take it away. Oh, thank you. So yeah, we're going to cover uh, maybe a little bit too much, but we're going to go through uh, sales price and how that is uh, something that it's pretty well decided when you get to this stage and then different types of brokers you can work with, you know, how to get from construction to sales and make a splash. And then after you do get on the market, um, when is it appropriate to do price adjustments? How do you look at those things? And then uh, hopefully uh, you don't have to do that and you go right to offer due diligence and then uh, managing the deal. So that is in summary what we're going to cover. Um, so first thing, uh, broker selection, if you go back and if you've been part of this series, uh, back in month zero, you decided um, who you're going to work with at that point or decided who you're not going to work with at that point. Um, so we're not in the last two weeks of construction here and going out and looking for a broker. You selected a broker based on your project type, and they're either a market leader, so there's somebody that is an Arlington Heights expert, for example, or they're a partner of yours, and they understand you know what you expect on a daily and weekly basis in terms of feedback, listing management, cleaning the property, um, how negotiations typically go. So, and then there's specialists and that's not necessarily uh, a market leading position, but it's someone that specializes in like relocation or a uh, local relocation, like from the city to what? Uh, Ron? Yes. You keep going. This is hilarious. This is when we're going live. I'm going to cut my mic and video for a second. So okay. you can see me, but keep running with it. Just run. I'm at the library. And somebody just knocked on my door. Okay. Are we still live? We're still live, brother. Keep going. All right, cool. I'm going to cut myself out. You got Yeah. Okay. No problem. Uh, you could probably just mute 
what you have going. So in any case, uh, and then market specialists are like, you think of them relocation, somebody across the country, but we work with uh, a specific example, market specialist, somebody that works with millennials that just had kids a few years back and now they're looking at Chicago schools and they decided to move to a town like Elmhurst, uh, Oak Park or Brookfield. Uh, so they specialize in that. So that just helps you. So as you said, pricing started back in acquisitions all the way in the first week of this series. Uh, and it was validated along the way. So the pricing is really a fait accompli. It started in month zero. There could be changes. Uh, typically when there are changes, they're negative because uh, you took too long and you brought yourself into a different season, or um, it's just uh, you took too long and the market's changed. So you, going back to acquisition, you're looking at comps that are six months old. If you've taken eight months for construction now, those comps aren't valid anymore. So uh, you're adjusting um, the plan to account for market reality. Um, so at this point, you've been down a long road. You've done a lot of work, a lot of construction, and a lot of things had to be done to get where you are today. You've solved the many problems. Um, most of those problems equated to money. And now you're going to start having thoughts about um, what price you want. Well, the price, when you start having thoughts about, I need 250k or I have to get 250k you have to realize that you don't make the market in this business you're in the market so you got to set your feelings and needs aside and you can't pack on $50,000 to pay for your construction sins because the market doesn't say it's worth $50,000 you actually have to uh, you know deal with that reality and not prolong it it's okay to try to stretch and adjust the price above what you actually want or think it's worth so you give yourself some room for negotiation, but adding up what you need and what you've paid already is not what the price is. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a mistake a lot of our guys make where, um, you know, you said, you know, pay for your, your construction sins or, or for your mistakes, right? Um, the best of the best, uh, remove all emotion. The best of the best are cold and calculated. You know, I was taught a long time ago, you have to be a, a, a sharpshooter. You can't just spray and hope that you're going to you're going to hit something on on the rehab, um, especially on in, in this case. The market is what the market is. You can't force the market to give you more. You can try, but uh, it's not going to turn out well. No, you'll just uh, end up, you know, with more holding costs. I mean, there's lucky scenarios where you can uh, recoup that. And in certain markets that are appreciating, you can. Um, positively change the pricing, but it has nothing to do with what you spent is the point of this and what you need. It has to do with what the market is. So you do get positive variances, but it has nothing to do with your needs. All right, did I go backwards or did I duplicate a slide? I think we already, uh, we got, okay. we already you said the difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the market leaders, this is the uh, example I gave her earlier. Um, you know, somebody yeah, that does the most in, in our life or a partner, somebody that understands what you want. We, we already covered this. So now you're managing the transition from construction to listing. So the first thing is um, you have to have, based on your project type, some rules about pre-sales and private listings. So for example, if you have a gut rehab, you don't want to have protect potential buyers walking through there before the walls are closed up because it will scare people out of the new house. You have to have clean construction sites. You have to have, if you're going to do pre-sales, you have to have a, um, very strict rules about when people can go in and very strict rules about how cleanup goes on your job site. Um, and then you'll have, you know, prospects can access by project type. As I said, if it's just a cosmetic rehab, once you get it clean and you get all the ugly areas covered or replaced, I should say, um, it's it's time to uh, put people in there, but the the goal is because uh, it really works. I mean, we've done hundreds and we've done pre sales maybe you know ten to twenty times. It does give us momentum, but prepare for a flawless splash. <clears throat> you want to be on site those last couple weeks almost all the time uh, because you, there's nothing more frustrating than working with a broker, working with a photographer, working with the stager to get something to the finish line and have the photographer show up and have you know five trucks out in the driveway. Uh, and you can't do the, the uh, so it, it's really, the transition to listing is really just finishing that last mile of construction that we covered last week. Why, why do you think most investors, or at least in my experience, totally bomb, you know, right at the end? You know, and, and I know we touched on this, I think in one of the other. I think it's it's uh, human nature. So the, 
once the drywall goes up, the project feels so finished. It's the whole Pareto principle, the, the 80, 20 rule that, um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but you have this emotional feeling that now that it's taken full shape, that there's not a lot to be done and people underestimate the time and money and they usually run out of both. They schedule a listing with not enough time or they don't have enough money to get the last details right. So that's invariably what happens there. So um, you just have to have a contingency and when you're newer, you're going to get surprised by how much time and money that that last mile takes. I love how you added prepare for flawless splash, right? So um, we've compared real estate you know, even even the 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 property itself to owning like a brick and mortar store, right? Like a Subway yep. or McDonald's or whatnot, yeah. and a profit and loss plan. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're building, if you're if you're rehabbing or uh, you're, you're rehabbing a flip or rehab to to own uh, or add a property rental portfolio, regardless, would you launch a McDonald's or a Subway if you're if you have the grand opening? Would you <laughs> would you just open the doors? With you know, yeah. crap everywhere. Yeah, you open the doors, the tiles not in yet. They get up to the counter, and there's only one register because the other ones aren't installed yet. No, oh, by the way, we only have Big Macs because we don't have the chicken fryers yet. No, you can't. But because... could you give me a contract, and then, yeah. uh, and then we'll, we'll work through the rest over yeah. the next thirty days? And it's um, it is it's just like a grand opening. You that's why businesses have um, soft openings to test out what it is. But in our business, if you're doing this more than once, you've had enough soft openings, you know really what to expect. But the point is that with Zillow and Redfin and all the digital access right now, when you make that initial splash, there's a huge opportunity there. But what you can have is to have that huge opportunity funnel what's 80% of your buyers into a product that's not done yet. You yeah. just can't do it because you've lost, uh, you've lost potential buyers. Those people are going to skip your house and go buy something else. Yeah, it's a shock and awe. And or um, what we've seen happen is if you go in there, if a, if, if a potential buyer or a prospect goes in there early and sees all the imperfections and the flaws, they're just going to question everything. Yeah, they're going to you know, wonder what's going on in the back of the wall. Yeah, and then they're going to start asking for permits and want to see the permits and ask for design and ask for this and then contact the village and ask the village, what did you do and all that. So, you know, if you're going to do it, do it right. It's, in my opinion, it's better to delay the launch for a week um, and, and dial and button everything up um, than the launching prematurely. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And you re we really try to shoot for Thursdays because most yeah. brokers and people that are looking on the weekends start making their lists of where to visit on a Thursday. On so we Thursday. don't have this rush to get out on Saturday morning. That, that's kind of a useless time gate. But you want to get your broker... If you're going to be paying a broker and we pay ours to do the hard work, um, they're doing quality control and they're the ones that are with you in that last two weeks and determining now that things are coming together, do you need staging based on the market or based on how the product came out? Um, so just a little, little bit of locations where um, there's areas of the home that leave too much to the buyer's imagination. People need to be shown what a room is or what it can be or how it can function. And if there's any question based on how we designed a room uh, that can't be answered readily by seeing it empty, we stage that problem out. We don't typically stage on a, a like a house that we build together because it it's self-explanatory. Uh, and then open houses and attending showings are really, you know, if you're at a first time home buyer market, you don't need somebody that's going to do that. But as, as you get up more pricey 500 and above, depending on markets, you're going to want an agent that's going to commit to do open houses every weekend, attend showings. Uh, and, and to negotiate and present your quality and your brand on your behalf. So how do you decide between a flat fee broker and a market leader? Like it, when, when, it all, Yeah, it's all really based on uh, um, price demographics of the actual product. So if we're in, um, say, Woodridge and we're right within 10% of the median, and it's we have a lot of model match housing stock, and it's really one of the most popular price points. We'll do either a flat fee listing, or we'll um, list with a broker partner that understands what we want in terms of reporting. So we're not man, we're not having to manage what we want from a listing perspective. When we get up higher, and we want to uh, you know populate train town houses with millennials moving out, we work with somebody in the city that does that, um, and then they just happen to have a requirement from us to do open houses and attending all showings. Cool. Uh, but we don't do flat fee generally unless it's a, you know, an as is wholesale.
Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so you made your splash. Everything should sell as planned. Now feedback's coming in. This is going to help you understand where errors were made. Hmm. And then you have to take that information, and it only means one of two things, uh, price reduction or uh, product correction. Um, so you have you could change things that uh, feedback. Very few things that feedback that come in, you can make a change on, but you should. You know, master bedroom upstairs, you're not going to be able to do anything about that. But right now, once you're listed, you have very few tools at your disposal. The, really, the only tool you have is cancel and wait for a better season or price drop. Um, you've really, all the work you've done from the day you bought the property to determine what the price is should be paying off now. And something, something's wrong um, with the season. Um, your or your price if it doesn't sell within 30 days or the quality of the product so 30 days so what happens when you when you're past that 30 day mark yeah so we do we do uh we call like frequent attention to what's in the pocket so you you tighten up um what's on the market and what's going under contract in that specific market um as tight as you can and look at what's available and what is selling and hypothesize why and you have to bring your product closer to that, be it add features or lower price. And that's it. So if you have a 4-2 Cape Cod with two up and two down in Mount Prospect, and you're at 425, and you're continually seeing at month after month, uh, at 21 days, the same similar model goes under contract at 399, that's your answer. Um, again, it goes back to you can't always get what you want. You have to pay attention to what the market says and do it. And some people don't have the luxury of dropping $25,000. So you got to look at other things, taking it off. If it happens to be October and holding till the spring market uh, or renting it, it, it really depends on the price point. But you really, if, if sale is your only exit, you have very few tools. And the only thing you can do is monitor the market and adjust. It's And it's not completely science. It's an art because there's in this business, there's very few you know, I have this property and there's three model matches and you can see what's happening. Yeah, you those. guys have been really, I mean, you've been really good at what you label as opportunity cost. Like if you're going to hold this property, I mean, when you get to day 30, it hasn't sold. Why? You figure it out and you move that sucker if you got to do a price change or whatnot. Um, for you to to try to shoot for, you know, to get your price and hold it for 30, 45, 60 more days, it just isn't worth it for you. Yeah, we had, in our sales meeting this morning, we actually went through that calculation. It actually is a piece of land, so our carry is only thirteen hundred. But we we're contemplating, <clears throat> you know, a ten thousand dollars price drop. I go, I we made the based on art and science the assessment that it would probably sell within ten months rather than selling it quick now and taking ten thousand. So that's part of the scientific part, and your carrying cost and your collateral and uh, or your excuse me, your cost of capital are going to come into play here. Cool. Uh, all right, so we, we've gone through all the stress. We finally have a contract. Hopefully, it's still a profitable contract. Uh, the key is you have to have different processes for different markets at this point. So in an FHA, Southwestern Suburb, first-time home buyer market, we have an extensive checklist that the buyer's lender, buyer's attorney, and buyer has to complete uh, because you don't want to put something under contract and have it fall out. Uh, we put that stuff in the addendums and the MLS remarks. And then you have, we have to have a broker that's familiar with that type of buyer. Um, so just as we have somebody that, you know, in a $700,000 house is familiar with that type of buyer and what they expect on a repair list in the FHA market, we have, we know that the repair list is not going to be a big deal, but the finance is going to be a pain point. So have brokers that are familiar with your process and are familiar with that market. Um, Contingent offers, just briefly, uh, you know, years ago, we didn't even consider those, but there's a dynamic in the, right now that supply um, that people that are moving to their second home uh, are reluctant to make an offer on a, a new house and until they've sold their, their current house. So they won't sell their current house and then go out and look because there's just so much competition and they're looking for something specific that now uh, contingent offers you know, our very important thing. Well, let me get back to that. So just like it was back how it's always been, the diligence has to be done. Just like I talked about the diligence on FHA buyer, the diligence has to be done on your buyer's buyer. You have to partner with a broker that's willing to call their lender, call 
find out about that deal just and make sure it's solid uh, because your deals depend upon it. Uh, so don't accept a contingent offer if somebody's saying things like, oh, we're going to list our property. Their property has to be listed at a minimum and best case under contract even uh, cleared to close. So we just took a contingent offer uh, last week, but the buyer's buyer was already cleared to close. So they knew what somebody would be looking at our price range would be looking for to even consider a contingent offer. And they actually had their ducks in a row. So um, it's, it can get pretty complicated. The point is they're out there now and there are certain cases where you should accept them. Yeah. And just make sure you're doing yeah, your due sure diligence on that. on that. Right. So this is uh, just a brief, this is how we kind of manage our probability. So if you think about this business, especially if you're doing more than one, uh, you have to manage your capital. So you have to project when something's going to sell so you could replace it with the next one or you know when you're going to get paid, et cetera. So we, uh, ours is a little more complicated than this, but in summary form, you know, when we do a signed contract, we think it's 65% probable that it's going to close. You know, after it gets through attorney and inspection, it's 75%. Uh, after the appraisal's in, we go to 80 and at clear to close, we go to 95%. So we manage our whole sales pipeline. Um, with a system. So uh, if, if you've been in a professional sales organization, it's it's all about probabilities, but you have to assign your own based on your market and your experience on deal fallout. Because what happens is if you don't manage that, you just assume a signed contract equals a check, you're going to be surprised, uh, especially in lower income areas or first time home buyer areas. You're going to have uh, a lot of these gates are very important to get through. Yeah, I had somebody asked me this yesterday on a call, um, an investor, and they're like, well, I want to start looking for my next deal, but, um, you know, I, I just got this one under contract, and there's, they're early off, or they're early on in their in their vetting process on this buyer, and I just said, look, if, if you're only doing two deals a year, <laughs> the extra two weeks isn't going to kill you. Make right. sure this buyer is going to close. Put all your energy and attention on the deal that you have in front of you. Get it done and then move on to the next one. Yeah, but when yeah. you're doing 20, 30 years, it's a different flow. Yeah, if you're new, you need to work on the last mile and you need to hand hold that contract from acceptance to closing. Make yep. sure you have the right attorney um, that, that understands. Uh, you know, a good attorney that's in investment real estate is going to understand uh, how important these gates are to you. And they're going to be notifying you and they'll help you manage that process. But yeah, if you're a first time through, Get this deal done and then start looking. You might, and when you get the clear to close, you probably have a couple of weeks. Start looking then, um, you know. But you really need to manage uh, the buyer inspection and the attorney review is where most deals die. Um, you need to manage that with all your effort on your when you're only doing one deal. And after that's done, you need to manage the financing of the buyer. Depending on the transaction, the financing may or may not be a risk point. It really depends on the mix of housing stock and what price point you're at. Uh, it might be a slam dunk, but you have to manage that process too, typically through your broker. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think Brent did a whole thing on appraisal, so just rewind that. He can explain that better than anyone. He's done the most volume of in areas that have appraisal challenges than anyone uh, in the whole Chicagoland area. Agreed. All right. All right. Anything else? No. You have anything for me? Um. No, other than thank you. So guys, this was, I mean, it was four parts. I know we machine gunned through this last one. Um, thanks for dealing with the technical difficulties there, getting chased no through the library. Um, guys, if you haven't seen the other parts of this series, please go back and check it out. I mean, Ron has done us a tremendous favor by by putting together this four-part series and and committed hours of his time to helping us out. And I'm very grateful to him for doing that. Um, at the end of the day, whether you're part of Click Invest or you're not part of Click Invest, if you're just out there getting into this for the first time or you, you've been doing this for years, you're going to see value in, in these, um, these last three, well, now four webinars we put together. There are nuggets in every single one of them. And Ron's taken his experience and his pain and his shared his best practices. So thank you again for doing this. Um, oh, thanks for having me. I, uh, I like doing this. Well, thank you, sir. And guys, please, please check them out. So again, go back to the other webinars. Uh, if you go to clickinvest.com, you click on the media tab and you could find the, uh, the past webinars we've done there. 
Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, I could email them to you. No big deal. You can email me at rosario at clickinvest.com. Uh, if you're an investor and you're stuck or you're looking to scale, Ron's your guy. Okay. He's, uh, he's definitely been a blessing to us and a blessing to several of our clients. So there's his information again. You can call or text him at the number on the screen, schedule a call through that link there, or reach out to him directly at ronpolonis.com. Ron, thank you again, dude. I appreciate it, man. Well, thanks for having me. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Yeah, have a great day. You too. Bye.